I looked at the weather forecast and I thought it's not going to snow. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> but uh, it's good to see you tonight. We're glad that you, you made it out on a cold Wednesday night and we welcome you here this evening. Let me mention a couple of things by way of announcements. Of course, don't forget our children are working on a Christmas program and uh, each Sunday. And so uh, we hope that you'll make plans to be here so they can be a part of that. We're looking forward to that. It'll be here before we know it. And uh, we want to uh, thank everyone who gave to Operation Christmas Child. The grand total, I believe, now is 44 shoeboxes. And so we are thankful for everyone that brought shoeboxes in for Operation Christmas Child. And, and uh, uh, what a wonderful ministry that is. And, and uh, uh, we've seen the Lord do some amazing things through that. Several years ago, whenever I was at Lighthouse and I was the children's director, we put a letter and our children packed those boxes. We kind of did it as a mission project with the kids. And we said, this has been given to you as a gift from Lighthouse Baptist Church. And it went to a Lighthouse Church somewhere overseas. They sent us a letter back. So we got this letter in our shoebox and, and said, your shoebox came to our, our church. And so what a, what a wonderful thing that is and what a neat experience that was. And so we thank you for that. And, and uh, thank you to everyone who's been involved with that. Any other announcements we need to make mention of tonight? Of course, don't forget the service is Sunday, and uh, we're winding down in Hebrews chapter 11, but uh, still got a few sermons left in that series, and so we want you to be here with us on Sunday, be inviting somebody to come with you. There's several on our prayer list we want to make mention of tonight. Of course, we want to continue to remember Hugh Kaufman, remember Gail Clark, that's Larry's sister, Selma Roberts, that's Lester's mother that had hip surgery, Remember, Gerald Malone, Gerald is home, and, and uh, I tried to call, but I didn't get to talk to him, but uh, Gerald's home, but he's got several doctor's appointments coming up in the next couple of weeks, going to have to have a procedure on his heel, and so he's still got a lot of things that he's going to have to deal with over the next little bit, so we want to continue to remember him. Uh, remember Pastor Roy Yelton, he went yesterday, I talked to him on the phone briefly, he was going yesterday to see the oncologist and the surgeon, I think, to check on uh, after his surgery, they're they're back uh, back in the states now, and and uh, uh, I'm sure that he'll be giving them a report at the church tonight. But I don't know what he heard from the doctor. Uh, but uh, continue to remember him. Continue to remember J Chad Dalton. Remember Sandra Gardner. Talked to Sandra yesterday, and she was going to rehab. Still having a lot of pain, and and so we want to continue to remember Sandra. Remember Richard Hall, Annabelle Kitzmiller. Uh, we added just. Recently to our prayer list, um, I'm looking because I think I, no, I did mark it. Uh, Marilyn Slaughter, we want to continue to remember her. Marilyn has been diagnosed with degenerative disc disease, and uh, she was able to stay for church Sunday, but she told me a couple of weeks ago, she said, I sat through Sunday school, and she said, I just couldn't sit through church. And so uh, remember her. She's having a hard time. Remember Elmer. Elmer still got problems with uh, blood clots in his legs, so we want you to remember him. Lynn Rogers had surgery today. But uh, last thing I heard, she would, she everything went well. She was doing fine. And so uh, continue to remember Lynn. Then I mentioned a couple of others the other day that I want to continue to mention, or one other that I want to mention. Darlene Fillers, uh, this is uh, the mother of a coworker uh, that I used to work with. And uh, she did have to have a leg amputated and, and just has not, she's got several other problems, needs a, uh, kidney transplant and just is not doing well she has she's she's done some better some days and she does worse some days and so they don't know what the outcome is going to be on that but they ask that we remember her and then my cousin nathan Broyles lives in winston-salem north carolina and he stepped off a step and broke both bones in his leg and is not able to put any weight on it whatsoever because of the type of break that he's had my aunt and uncle are trying to travel back and forth to Winston-Salem. He sells insurance, and so he's trying to travel, and 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 he's he's dependent on somebody to take him, dependent on somebody to get him in and out of the house, and and really think it'll be a long recovery for him to get over that. So we ask that you remember him. And I know there was you mentioned somebody else, and I've already forgot who it was because I didn't write it down. Betty Gothard's brother, son. Okay. Okay, remember this. 
Now I heard from Betty Crest today. She's in Florida, uh, but uh, she was sending some well wishes today. We want to remember them while they're going to be away from us for a little while. Anybody else have anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nadine God. Okay, remember this. Remember Bill. Bill's uh, got some tests coming up. Uh, we were just talking about that and, and been having some problems here lately. So remember him. I noticed that, well, I noticed she was holding her arm funny, and so. Yeah, that's not, it's not any fun. I've, I've, I've been chased by a few cows. I've not actually been, I've not been caught by any, but I've been chased by a few. So, yeah. Or they gave up or something, I don't know. The ones that come after me, but anyway. So remember Julia. Anybody else have anything tonight? It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for this time that we could be in your house and Lord be amongst your people. And Lord, we thank you for this time of, of uh, fellowship that we had earlier now. We thank you for the, the ladies who provided the meal. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless us tonight as we uh, enter this study now of the tabernacle. We just ask that you just uh, bless in a special way, speak to hearts and do a work in lives tonight. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise for everything that's done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn with me, if you would, to your Bibles to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. If anybody looked at me shuffling, I didn't get my holes punched very good in my notes. Half of them are out of this notebook, but I think they're all there. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on there for a minute. Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 6 is what we're going to read tonight. And we're looking at the golden altar of incense tonight. Exodus chapter 30. And we'll read verses 1 through 6. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof. Thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold, round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Now, over the last several weeks, we've been learning that there are seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. And each one of them speak of, uh, uh, speak of Christ and they speak of salvation. So when you entered the door of the tabernacle by faith, you came first to the brazen altar. And the brazen altar speaks of Christ, our sacrifice. And then next we come to the brazen laver. And the laver speaks of Christ, our sanctification. And then we enter into the holy place. 
And in the holy place, uh, on the side to the right, there's the table of showbread, and that's Christ our sustenance. And then on the other side, uh, from the table of showbread, there's the lampstand or the candlestick. Uh, the King James Version calls it a candlestick, but uh, we've said that a lampstand is probably a better uh, description because there are lamps that are on the top that burn with oil. And so we're not picturing a, a candle that burns and consumes itself and then eventually burns itself out. But we're talking about a lamp that burns from another power. And we said that we as Christians, of course, are to operate on the power of the Holy Spirit. And the oil in that lamp uh, represents the Holy Spirit. And so the lampstand pictures Christ our sight. And uh, then uh, we're going to go on as we're here in the Holy of Holies, and we're going to consider tonight the golden altar, and this is the altar of incense. Now, remember, everything after we enter in um, to the holy place is made, and into the Holy of Holies is made out of gold. And this speaks of Christ, our supplication. Christ, our supplication. So we're going to look in our text again in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1. And it says, and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. And we're going to stop right there for just a moment. And let's talk about the purpose of this altar. The purpose of this altar. And the purpose of this altar is very simple. It's to burn incense upon. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. So the question is, what does the incense stand for? What does the incense teach? Incense is a perfume that you burn. And when you burn it, it gives off a sweet-smelling odor. And it fills the room with this sweet smell of burning incense. Now, this incense that was burned in the tabernacle, it burned continually and continuously. It kept burning, and it kept burning. And what we're going to find out is that it was fed by the coals from the brazen altar that we find in the courtyard of the tabernacle. So in the Bible, when we're looking at incense, in the Bible, incense illustrates, and it is a symbol of prayer or the intercession or intercession to God. So let me give you an example of this. We've got it here on the screen. In Psalm 141 and verse 2, it says this, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, notice that phrase, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Now, as I said, this incense was to burn in the tabernacle continually and continuously. And the priest would take this mixture of spices and they would put it on the altar of incense and continually this smoke would be going up there inside the tabernacle and it would be perfuming the tabernacle all the time. Now, the question is, what does that speak of? It speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ who can, is continually ever live, who continually ever lives to make intercession for us. And, and we're not just reading into this. This is actually literally the meaning. You see, we've been saying all throughout this study that this Old Testament tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. Look in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. And in these verses, we're going to read about the unfinished work of Christ. There is a finished work of Christ, and there is an unfinished work of Christ. And so I want us to look at it, and I am going to put it on the screen. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Now, the finished work of Christ is the brazen altar. Christ died for our sins, and He died once, and He rose from the dead. And that proved that He was the Son of God. It proved everything that He said was true. That's the finished work of Christ. But the unfinished work of Christ is the golden altar, the altar of incense. Now, notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So Jesus constantly, always, 
just as this sweet incense went up in the tabernacle, Jesus, who is our intercession and our supplication, ever lives to make intercession for us. Day after day after day in the heavenlies, Jesus is making intercession for us. Then in Hebrews chapter 8, if you're, if you're there with me in Hebrews, turn over a page to Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8, the writer of he Hebrews says in verses 1 through 5, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle for. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. And you remember, I quoted that verse from Exodus, that Moses was to follow the pattern. And we said that over and over and over again in our introduction. So these verses are saying that there was a tabernacle in the wilderness. But this tabernacle in the wilderness was just a picture. It was just an illustration. It was just a prophecy of the true tabernacle. There was a priest in the wilderness, but that priest was just a picture, just a prophecy, just an illustration of Jesus, our great high priest. And the Old Testament tabernacle and the Old Testament priest were examples and they were shadows of heavenly things. And God came to Moses, and he said, Moses, I want you to build this tabernacle. And he said, Moses, you do everything just like I told you to do it. Follow the pattern that I have given you, because it's an illustration. It's an example. It's a shadow of the true tabernacle that's in heaven. And Jesus is our great high priest. And just as these Old Testament priests offered incense that went up to God continually, Jesus is now in that tabernacle in heaven offering incense that's going to the Father continually. And what is that incense? He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now let's look in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, the holy place in the tabernacle is made with hands. The tabernacle and the temple were just figures of the true place, just types, just illustrations of the true. But where is Christ entered? Into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So where is Jesus? He's in heaven. What's he doing? He's carrying out the function of a priest. How? Because he's offering incense. And what is that incense? It's intercession. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And so when an Old Testament priest offered intercession upon the altar of incense, it was just a picture of what Jesus, our great high priest, does when he offers intercession for us. And isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is praying for us? See, that's the reason that we have eternal security. Therefore, the, the Bible says, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Now, what does that mean? That he's able to save to the other most. Does that mean that he's able to save the worst sinner? Well, he certainly is, but that's not what it means. The Bible says that he's able to save unto the uttermost. It means that he will literally save you all the way. 
You don't have to worry about whether you're saved one day and you've lost it the next. He'll never let you go. He will save you to the uttermost. He'll save you right down to the end and he'll never let you go. Why? Because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now I have a question. Did Jesus ever pray a prayer that wasn't answered? Obviously, the answer is no. Jesus, when he prayed, he said, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. That you always hear me. Jesus always prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And Jesus always prayed in the will of God. And Jesus' prayer was always answered. I thank thee, Father, that thou always hearest me. And let me tell you what Jesus has prayed for you and, and what he is praying for you. Let's look in John chapter 17. I want you to turn here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. But turn to John chapter 17. See, there are many people who don't understand the eternal security of the believer. And they think that we're eternally secure because we, we just are so good that we hold out. But that's not what it is. The, the fact of the matter is we're eternally secure because Jesus is praying for us. Now, I want you to see how Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17 and verse 9. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now look in verse 15. And he tells us what he prays for his disciples. I pray that thou shouldest uh, take them... Th uh, sorry, let me read it again. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now, Jesus didn't pray that we'd be taken to heaven when we get saved. But Jesus said, now, Father, I'm not praying for the people of the world. He says, I'm praying for my sheep. And he says, there's a very special prayer that I'm praying. There's a very special incense that I'm offering. I'm praying, Father, that you will keep them from evil. And literally, this means keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the devil. And he, Jesus says, I pray for this. And you say, well, that's good that Jesus prayed that for his disciples because that's what you just said, that, that he prayed this prayer for his disciples. I wish that he would have prayed it for me. Well, can I tell you that he did? And he does. Let's skip down or let's look at, uh, yeah, skip down to verse 20. John chapter 17 and verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he might as well have said this. Not only am I praying for Peter and James and John and all the disciples, but I'm praying for the members of Beulah Baptist Church. And I'm praying for the pastor of Beulah Baptist Church. I pray for these, uh, uh, these disciples and I pray for these church members. I pray not that you'll take them out of the world, but I pray that you will keep them from evil. And I don't just pray for them. I don't just pray for the disciples, but I look down through time and I look down at every person that's ever saved, every blood child of God who will believe in me through the ministry and the word of the apostles. And I pray that you'd keep them from evil. And the father always hears the son. And notice that he says, I pray that you will keep them. Why do we believe in the, in the eternal security of the believer? Because we're kept by the power of God. And he says, I thank thee, Father, that thou always hearest me. You always hear me. And so, therefore, he's able to save unto the uttermost because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's the unfinished work of Jesus. He ever lives making intercession night and day and day and night for us. Just as this sweet perfume went up from the tabernacle ascending to the nostrils of God. But not only does this golden altar uh, of incense speak of Jesus' ministry of intercession for us, it also speaks of Jesus' ministry of intercession through us. Because not only is the tabernacle a description of deity, but the tabernacle is also a blueprint of the believer. We've been saying that all the way along. The tabernacle also pictures not only just Jesus interceding for us, but Jesus interceding through us in our prayer life. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, And when he had taken the book, 
the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors. Now this is just another word for incense that it's talking about here, which are the prayers of the saints. And what exactly is this verse saying? Having golden bowls of these of incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. The incense is the prayers of the saints. Now let's look in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now this angel, this second angel that's mentioned here in verse 3, is Jesus. This messenger is Jesus Christ. And notice how he's coming. He's coming with his hands full of incense. And he takes this sweet incense uh, of his worth, this sweet incense of his fragrance, and he mixes it with our prayers, and he offers it before the throne. You see, the incense is the prayers of the saints. That's what chapter 5 tells us. But then chapter 8 tells us that this heavenly messenger with much incense mixes that in with our prayers. And that's what this tabernacle speaks of. That's what the altar of incense in the tabernacle speaks of. It's a figure. It's an illustration. It's a pattern. It's a type. It's a prophecy um, that... One day, every child of God will be able to offer his or her prayer to God. And the believer comes to God in prayer, not with the wood of his human goodness, but with the sweet incense of the worth of Jesus. Both hands full of incense, saying, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. And that's what this incense is. It's the name of Jesus. It's the person of Jesus. It's the work of Jesus. So how do we pray? The incense represents the prayer. But, he's, but we said in the beginning that this incense was burned with fire. And that fire came from the coals from the brazen altar. And the brazen altar represents the blood sacrifice. And so when you pray, you pray in the power of the blood and in the name of Jesus. Your prayer is going through two altars. It's going through those coals that are taken from the brazen altar and burned up at the golden altar, at the altar of incense. So, so you see, there were two altars. The brazen altar spoke of Christ in his humiliation. That's at the gate. That's Christ our sacrifice. But the golden altar of incense speaks of Christ and His exaltation. The brazen altar is for sinners. The golden altar of incense is for saints. The brazen altar is for sacrifice. But the golden altar of incense is for supplication. But you can't come to the golden altar of incense until you've come past the brazen altar, until you've come by the blood of the cross. And remember that we said that brass speaks of judgment and gold speaks of glory. You see, when your sins are put under the blood of Jesus, then you're ready to pray. And then you can come to the Father in the name of Jesus as a child of God. So we've talked about, first of all, the purpose of the altar. It was an altar of incense. Now we're going back to our text. Exodus chapter 30, and I want you to think about the pattern of the altar. The pattern of the altar. And when we look at the pattern, we will see what it tells us about prayer and the sweet hour of prayer. So let's look again at Exodus chapter 30, and we're going to see what it tells us about prayer in verses 1 and 2. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, 
four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall the height shall be the height thereof. And let's just stop reading right there. And let me say this. This was the smallest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And this speaks to me that when we pray that we're not heard for our much speaking, as the Bible says. But it's also the tallest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And that tells me that we're nearer to heaven when we're on our knees. It's the tallest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. Now, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1 tells us that it's to be built out of acacia wood. And then if we were to go back and read in verse 3, we would see that it was to be overlaid with pure gold. So it's made out of wood and gold, and you already know that the wood speaks of the humanity of Jesus, and the gold speaks of the deity of Jesus. And this is beautiful everywhere we see it, but it's especially true when we think about prayer. It's especially true when we think about intercession for Jesus Christ is our mediator. He's our special mediator because of the wood and because of the gold. The wood of his humanity and the gold of his deity. That's the reason that the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. See, the wood and the gold together make Jesus our intercessor, make him our supplication, makes him our mediator. You see, on the one hand, he puts down the wood of his humanity, but on the other hand, he puts down the gold of his deity. See, he's both. He is both God and he is man. He is the God-man. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, do you remember what Job prayed in the book of Job? In Job chapter 9, Job's friends came by to sympathize, and and you may remember the story, but they stayed behind to sermonize. And uh, Dr. Harold Wilmington said it was the strangest Bible conference that was ever held, and, and he said, perhaps at no other Bible conference in history have so many preachers preached to so few in attendance where the congregation enjoyed it less. Job's friends criticized, and they tried to give advice. And Job knew that he had a problem. He knew that he had confusion. He knew that he needed guidance. And Job's heart just cried out, and he said, Oh God, would there that, that there would be a daysman. That was Job's words. He said, a daysman, that he might lay his hand upon us both. Job said, listen, God, I'm not God. I can't reason with deity. And he said, and God is not man. He's not going to come down to my level. And Job said, I'll never be able to talk to him because he's God and I'm man and I'll never be able to understand. And he'll never be able to understand me and commune with me because he's God and I'm man. And so do you know who Job was crying out for? He was crying out for Jesus. Jesus, God and man in one person. And that's what the altar of incense speaks of. Wood and gold. Jesus is the reason that we're able to get through to God. This is the, Jesus is the reason that we're able to intercede because of the deity and the humanity of the Savior. Now we also need to see as we're looking at the, the, uh, the pattern of this altar of incense, we need to see the horns of the altar. Notice again in verse 2. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit shall be the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof, and the horns thereof shall be of the same. So the Bible teaches that there are four horns on this altar. There are four horns on the four corners of the golden altar. And it's talking about animal horns. We explained this before, just like goats have, or like what a cow would have. And so each corner of the altar, uh, of this altar, there was a horn, and it was covered with gold. Now, what does that speak of? Well, a horn in the Bible, we explained this before, speaks of power. Let's look look with me here. I'm going to put it on the screen. Luke chapter 1, verse 69. And this verse speaks of the Lord, and it says, And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. 
a horn of salvation, a horn of deliverance, a horn of power. This speaks of the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are four horns, one in each of the four corners. And that tells us that prayer reaches to the four corners of the earth. Four is the number of the earth. And prayers and supplications, this tells us that prayers and supplications should be made for all men. And that Jesus intercedes for all. And that we should intercede for all people. And by the way, I'll just stop right here and put in a little commercial. My plan is when we finish this study to maybe study one week and look at the numbers of the Bible. We've talked about a lot of the meanings of these numbers. We'll tell you where we get those things from. The Lord's been working on me on, about that. So I think that's what we're going to do when we finish this study. So you want to keep coming even after the tabernacle's over. But anyway, again, four is speaking of the four corners of the earth. We need to intercede for all. Now let's look in our text again. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 4. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And so this altar is to be carried. Everywhere they went, they were to carry this golden altar with them. Now what's the lesson here? The lesson is that prayer is for all times and for all places. You don't have to be in a certain place to pray. Jesus is always present to hear our cry. Intercession is not limited to time or to place. When you go to work tomorrow, you better carry that golden altar of incense with you. When you go on vacation, you better take a vacation with God and not a vacation with from God, because this altar was portable so that it could be carried along with them. And notice that also that there's a golden crown on top of this altar. Notice again, it says in verse 4, And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it. And so it has a crown, and that's not by accident either. See, the crown speaks of the sovereignty of our Lord. Now, if you remember, if you go back and look at the brazen altar, the brazen altar had no crown of gold. But this altar does have a crown of gold because the brazen altar speaks of Christ in his humiliation. It speaks of Christ coming as a man, dying on the cross, taking our sins on the cross. But the golden altar of incense speaks of Christ in his exaltation. So he's crowned king of kings as he's interceding for us. And so that means that he's not interceding with uncertainty. He's not just pleading and begging God. He's commanding with authority because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So now we've talked about the purpose of the altar and the pattern of the altar, and we need to look at the position of the altar. The position of the altar. Now let's look again in Exodus uh, chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. Now, where is this golden altar. Well, we just read right there, it was right before the veil. And the veil is right before the mercy seat. And the mercy seat represents the throne of God. That's the place where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. And this is the way to come into the throne room. It's past the golden altar of incense, you see. Uh, they were to approach God through prayer and through intercessions. That's the way that we're to approach God. And that's what he's talking about. God says in this verse, it's there where God dwells. And God says in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22, there I will meet with thee. Where? Right beyond the altar of incense. And the reason that God's not real to some folks and the reason that some folks say well, they just don't believe in God is because they try to bypass the altar of incense. 
And you can't do that. If you want to come into the throne room, if you want to dwell where the glory of God is, you must come past the altar of incense. Have you done that? Do you come with your hands full of the worth of Jesus? Do you come with a sweet incense of prayers? Is there lifting up from your life continually and perpetually a prayer of praise to God? Because the Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. Not only is there the golden altar right in front of the mercy seat, but it's linked with the candlestick. It's linked with the lampstand. Uh, God says in verses 7 and 8 that when Aaron the high priest comes in to trim the lamps, that he's to put incense upon the altar. And the trimming of the lamps and the burning of the incense and the refreshing of the incense all go side by side. They're linked together. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that our intercession and our testimony must always be linked together. You see, you can't let your light shine unless your incense burns. That's what he's saying. And I don't believe that this was put there by accident or by chance. I believe as God told Moses, you do everything just like I told you. Follow the pattern that I've give you, given you. The time when you trim the lamps is the time that you freshen the incense and you put the incense on the altar. Now, why is that? You see, there are two dangers among people in church. One danger is that we as a church, is, we'll go out and we'll try to be witnesses and we'll try to let our light shine, but we haven't prayed. And we try to talk to people about God before we talk to God about people. And we wonder why we fail. You trim the lamp, but you don't burn the incense. And there are others who burn the incense. They intercede, they pray, and they say, God, I've got lost family members and I've got lost friends. Would you bring them to Christ? And they pray and they pray and they pray, but they never trim the lamp. They never let their light shine. They never speak out for Jesus at all. And one's not a substitute for the other. We're supposed to do both. Prayer will never be a substitute for a verbal witness, for telling other people about Jesus, for letting our light shine. Now, don't get me wrong. It's important that we pray and that we intercede for people. The Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher? But the Bible says that we're also to be witnesses. We're to speak. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But God forbid that we would ever speak until we first pray. Now, one last thing, and we're going to be finished. I want you to notice the people of the golden altar. The people of the golden altar. And we're going to read Exodus chapter 30 again, verses 9 and 10. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereupon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering. Neither shall she pour any drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And then the rest of the chapter, as you go on to read, it's so plain that God does not want anybody who is not qualified to fool with this altar. Notice what it says in verses 32 and 33. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. That's talking about the holy oil. Neither shall you make any other like it. That's the sweet perfume that, that's, that's going to be burned and that holy oil that's going to be used for anointing. After the composition of it, it is holy and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it or, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger shall even be cut off from his people. And then the Lord tells him how to make this incense uh, beginning in verse 34, but we're not going to read that. We're going to go on down to verse 37 and notice what it says in verses 37 and 38. And so for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make it to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto it to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Now God says... There's a sacred anointing oil that represents the Holy Spirit and there's a sacred incense and it represents prayer. 
And God says that it's to be made with a special formula. They've got a special recipe for how to make it. And no one, no one should ever mix this and use it for themselves without the proper authority. And God says, if you do, you'll be cut off. And you would be. You could be, and you could be put to death for doing so. Now let's look very quickly. You can look at it here on the screen. Uh, if you want to turn there, you can. Second Chronicles chapter 26 for just a moment. We're going to see a case in which it was not used in the correct way. And we're kind of picking up in the middle, but notice what it says. But he was when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not to thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be, for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand. That's what they used to carry that incense and burn that incense, to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest and the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. Now what happened? God says this altar of incense is very sacred. And he says this incense is very sacred. And God said, don't make any of this incense to use for anything except for the altar of incense. And God says, only the priest, only Aaron and his sons are to burn incense. And if anybody else tries, he'll be smitten. Now what's God telling us? What's he talking about? Well, he's telling us that these things are only for God's priest only for god's priest they don't belong to other to to other to other people and christians are priests we talked about this last week god says only the priest talking about aaron and his sons are to burn incense and he says if anybody else tries they're going to be smitten now what's god telling us what's he talking about he's telling us that these things are only for god's priest they don't belong to other people and the way that he's made us to be a king and a priest, you know, we talked about last week that you might say, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm not a priest. We're all a royal priesthood. And the way that he's made us a king and a priest, the Bible says, is with his blood. And so anybody who attempts to serve the Lord and to pray and to worship or do anything else except coming through the blood and becoming an anointed priest with a whole with the holy oil of the Holy Spirit upon him is sure for the judgment of God. You see, there's some people that have this false idea, this false belief today. You've heard people talk about that they believe in the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. Anybody ever heard that before? Well, that's not so. Don't get the idea that anybody can get up and stand up and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's not so. Because God's not the Father of everyone. Don't get the idea that anybody can come to God and pray and get their prayers answered. They can't. We must come God's appointed way. And we better check up in our life and make sure that we've come and We've come past that brazen altar that our sins have been put under the blood. We better make sure we've been washed in the blood. And then we better make sure that we've come past the laver. Do we believe the Word of God? That's what the laver represents. Have we been sanctified by the Word? Have we allowed the Word to cleanse us? And have we come past the table of showbread? Have we fed upon Jesus? Is Jesus the one who nourishes us? Have we come past the golden candlestick? Are we walking in the light? Then can we approach the golden altar of incense and come into the throne room. And let me tell you, God is a holy God. And you come by the blood or you don't come at all. You come as a priest or you don't come at all. Don't think that God is honor bound to answer the prayers of the lost. He's not. There are some people who believe that they can 
pray to God and, and they can pray even if they're lost and they can say, God, here's some things that I want and treat God like a butler and say, all right, go out and get them for me. It's not the way it works. God says you'll get judgment. He says that's what you'll get. But if you come past the brazen altar, the bloody altar, if you feed on the Son of God, if you wash in the labor of the Word of God, if you walk in the light of the testimony of God, then you can offer incense upon the altar of incense. And then God says you'll be one of my priests. That's where we're going to close out for tonight with the altar of incense. Anybody got any questions or comments before we close out tonight? Again, we want to thank you for being here. I think I failed to mention a couple of things that I meant to an announce at the beginning that I want to come back and announce. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the ladies that have prepared the Wednesday night meals. And man, we had a good one tonight. And and uh, uh, I enjoyed that so much. And it's always good to get an early thing. I looked forward. The best meal that we had at school was Thanksgiving dinner. The rest of the school food wasn't fit to eat. But Thanksgiving dinner was pretty good. And I always looked forward to that. And I thought, I'm not going to get two Thanksgiving dinners this year. But I did anyway. So thank you all. I appreciate that so much. It's been wonderful. And I've enjoyed it. And then I think the other thing I failed to mention is we are going to have a community Thanksgiving service that we are going to host here with Blessed Hope. And that will be Wednesday the 27th. That's the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. We hope you'll make plans to be here. And Travis Pearson, the pastor of Blessed Hope, is going to preach that night. And so uh, Travis and I hopefully are going to get together this weekend. I told him I'd like to take him out to breakfast for lunch. Uh, I've not actually even had the privilege. I've talked to him on the phone and not had the privilege of meeting him. But they're going to be coming over with us. And so we're excited about that and wanted to make mention of that. And I think I failed to mention it earlier. Anything else we need to make mention of before we close out tonight? Again, thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. Have a good night. Brother Al, would you close us in prayer? I believe in that part right there. The body is the ground.